The opening scene displays an advertisement for a newly released game called New Gate. The game is a virtual reality MMORPG that allows the players to do everything they can imagine. On a fateful day, the New Gate game suddenly switched to a death game, where deaths in the game were alternate to death in reality, and it was impossible to log out of it. An adventurer in the game whose name is Shin, the overpowered protagonist, takes up the task of fighting the monsters and opponents in the game as the self-appointed hero, in an attempt to end it. After freeing some players, he defeats some other monsters until he gets to the true boss at the final level, the Gatekeeper Origin. Shin strikes the monster, but he is surprised to see his body regrowing. Shin charges at the regrowing boss with the enthusiasm of a kid on too much sugar, but it is almost like watching a dog chase its tail which is amusing but pointless. Shin expends all his efforts, and he successfully defeats it. Shin checks to see if the game players are leaving the game world successfully. Just as he tries to log out, the new gate opens up to him unexpectedly, and he wonders what is happening because there should be no new events. Suddenly he finds himself in a lonesome woods that makes him wonder if he is still in the game world. He then goes on to check his stats, and he realizes he has improved significantly. His defeat didn't end up being totally useless after all. Unfortunately, he finds it difficult to log out of the game, because he is no longer connected to the internet. Shin assumes that he is now in reality, so he uses an item to set his home base and find his way home. He spots an unfamiliar castle on his way, and he passes through it until he finally arrives at his destination. Just as he walks in, he sees some men harassing a girl. Unexpectedly, a monster appears before them, and it charges forward to harass her, but Shin intercepts it. Shin defeats it, and he deduces that he can control the power of his magical skills, so physical attacks have no strain on him. Shortly after, the girl introduces herself as Tierra Lucent, and she asks if he knows her master because he mentioned that he is home. Tierra describes her master as the acting shopkeeper of the Moon Sanctum, Shni Rezar. The name rings a bell to Shin, and he questions if she is the beautiful elf with an incredible body and long silver hair. For our ever so brilliant hero, Shin sure does have selective memories for forgetting her name but remembering her features. Tira stares speechlessly at his intense description, but he waves it off. Shin asks her about Shni's location, but she refuses to give him. However, she says she can take a message for her for a fee. Shin hands her a coin with more value than what she requests. She realizes he brought the coin from an item box that only kings and elders of a limited species can use. She adds that the jail gold coin is an item used for amplifying magic that is worth at least 10 billion jewels. Shin is surprised at her description because jails is the lowest currency in the game. Tierra asks him for his real identity, and he introduces himself as an adventurer and a high human. Tierra is surprised because the six high-ranking humans have gone extinct during the Dusk of Prosperity 500 years before. She explains that it was an event where many people vanished, including the high humans. Shin wonders if it is related to the situation of the thousands of players that were trapped in the game, but he rescued them. After analyzing the situation, it turns out that Shin is currently in a new world 500 years after rescuing them. Tira cuts his thoughts short, and he thanks her for the information. He asks her to hold on to the coin and she calls him an idiot for giving out something so valuable, but she eventually accepts and drools over it. Everyone sure has their lucky days. Shin claims it would be a useful magical tool for elves like her. Tira is surprised that he recognizes her elf nature because she had her master cast an illusion spell on her because black-haired elves like her are cursed symbols of misfortunes. Tierra was kicked out of her village because her misfortune caused the monsters to constantly attack them. It was then that her master rescued her and also placed a barrier around the shop which has helped her live peacefully for 100 years. Shin realizes that the monster he slaughtered before appeared because she stepped out of the barrier. Who could have imagined such a beautiful elf would be a monster magnet. Tira tells him they are still searching for a way to lift the curse when he asks about it. After careful consideration, Shin analyzes a skill set from his status that can overturn the curse, and he calls her curse the curse gift because it can change her hair color with the monsters attacking her. Quite a fancy name for a ridiculous curse. Shin uses the skill set that helps her remove the curse, but only a part of her hair returns to its original color. However, she feels grateful about it. Shin takes her out of the barrier, and he promises to kill any monster if they end up appearing because of her. It doesn't seem like Shin would have any monster slaughtering brag this time, because none of the monsters appeared before them. Tira confirms that her curse has truly been lifted. She stares at the sky with tears in her eyes. They return to the Moon Sanctum, and she thanks him again. Tira informs him that her master will arrive later, so Shin proposes exploring the nearby towns to find out about the world, because it is likely his other support characters are in existence, if Shni turns out to be his true support character. Tierra gives him a letter of introduction that can help him bypass the lengthy inspection in the Beirelict Kingdom. Shin wonders if she should give him since he is a stranger, but she tells him he helped her, and he is good-natured so she is certain. Shin bids her farewell, and he arrives at the kingdom where he bypasses the long queue with the letter. According to his escort, he says Shin can even gain access to the king with the letter. He takes him to the Adventurer's Guild, and he bids him farewell. Shin enters the guild where he meets a receptionist, 
Cecilia, who has an identical twin, Cecilia, in another section. He registers as an adventurer, and he waits in the restaurant for his registration to be complete. Cecilia arrives in the restaurant dressed as a waitress, and she offers him some refreshments. Cecilia states her mission when Shin complains of her intense stare. One would expect a full-blown confidence with ladies from a fearless hero like himself, but it turns out his fearlessness is only applicable to monsters, and not beauties. Cecilia asks about his letter of identification, and wonders if she can verify its authenticity in another room. He agrees to show her after eating because he doesn't want to meet the guildmaster yet. Cecilia disrupts his plans by showing him the guildmaster who is already seated behind him. Shin recognizes him as the weird guy from the reception. They get talking, and he tells Shin he wants to confirm the authenticity of the letter of introduction. Immediately he puts his letter on it, the glow from the two letters verifies its authenticity. The guildmaster tells him about the letter of introduction as the most trusted form of identification, and that it is an extremely powerful item to have because many people wish to steal it for nefarious purposes. He advises Shin to drop it if he is not confident about protecting it, a rather sneaky way of acquiring someone's property. Shin assures him he can handle it because he doesn't wish to let Tira, who gave him the letter down. The guildmaster accepts his decision, and he hopes they get along. He also proposes that they test Shin's skills. Later at night, Shin lies on his bed weakly, and he dozes while anticipating Shni's return. He wakes up the next day and he is disappointed about not waking in reality. He visits the guild again and she gives him the guild access card while also explaining how the guild rules work. Shin finds a job immediately, and he sets off. Shin sits in the woods looking for a hilt grass to harvest, and he claims it was even faster in the game to harvest one than it is now. He suddenly spots a skull-faced jack monster, and he realizes that the monster is dangerous with its skill level. He remembers the adventurers talking about it in the guild, and he looks to see the damage it has caused. Shin decides to fight it, but the skull face restrains his first and second hit, causing his sword to break. He finally defeats it with a high level of skill that sends the skull face's sword flying into the palace unknowingly to him. He picks up the gemstone that dropped after the monster disappears. In the Berelict Palace Castle, Lady Rion orders the guards to appraise the mysterious sword and the attacker. She admits that whoever sent the sword flying must be powerful. Shin strolls into the kingdom to find a crowd gathered around some adventurers who are badly injured. Shin asks about the situation from a young man who explains to him that twelve adventurers set into the northern woods, but a skull face attacked them, and only four of them made it out alive. He also mentions that some eyewitnesses saw a sword flying out of the woods into the castle, but fortunately, no one was hurt. When the man asks if Shin knows about it, Shin denies it blatantly. Well, it turns out that lying is another impressive skill Shin possesses considering the efforts he puts into denying his involvement. The man tells Shin to inform him if he has any information about it, because the higher-ups have him on the case. After he leaves, Shin apologizes for the sword. He enters the Adventurer's Guild to find a lot of adventurers present. Cecilia tells him a high-priority extermination request has been issued for the Skull Faces since it appeared near the kingdom. Shin reports that he defeated the Skull Face monster, and he shows her the gem he obtained in return. Cecilia loses her cool for a short while until Shin calls her to order, because she is usually not so expressive. Cecilia's colleague, Else, walks in to interrupt them, and Cecilia informs him about Shin's claim. Shin realizes there is no way to prove he truly defeated the Skull Face Jack, because he didn't pick up its not-so-impressive gear, but Else assures him they would confirm if the gem has Skull Face's mana. Shin asks if the Skullhead Jack monsters have been appearing frequently. Cecilia explains that some monsters have been appearing, but the Skull Face Jack level monsters are very rare. When Shin tells them that the Skullhead Jack he killed had a level of 359, they are shocked by the information. Cecilia leaves to appraise the gem, while Else tells Shin he could be an A-rank adventurer if he truly killed the high-level Skullhead Jack. Shin implores him to keep it a secret because he doesn't want attention. Shin goes to the restaurant where he meets Cecilia in charge this time, and they sit together. It seems Shin has grown more confident, and he now feels more free. Shortly after, another adventurer with a magic spear called Venom sits before Shin, and he introduces himself as Wilhelm Alvis. Wilhelm asks Shin if he is a new adventurer, and Shin replies instantly that he has spent just three days, so he is still categorically new. Wilhelm confirms that he is, but according to his deduction, Shin's weapon is better than an average weapon. Shin explains that his weapon seems different because he is not from their kingdom. Wilhelm realizes that Shin not being from the kingdom is the reason he is not fretting at the mention of his name. Wilhelm is one adventurer known for his reputation for killing undead monsters and his ever-aggressive face. After their chit-chat, Shin shows his fearlessness for Wilhelm which impresses him, and they both eat together. Shin visits the library to read about the events from the Dusk of Prosperity that happened 500 years back. The Guild Council discusses the issue of the Skullhead Jack that just appeared in the Northern Woods. The Guild Master informs them it has been slain, and the gem that was returned is being verified. He talks about the Slayer without mentioning his identity. One of the members confirms that the gem truly belongs to the Skullhead Jack, 
and it has a skill level of 359 after appraising it. The Guildmaster fears that more monsters may start trooping in, so he wants some guards to be stationed at night. Another member asks to know the identity of the Slayer because the Skullface has brandished unusual equipment. The Guildmaster offers to tell him about the weapon, but not the Slayer because he has agreed to keep his identity secret. When the Guildmaster asks why he wishes to know, he explains that the flying sword landed in the palace at exactly the time of the Skullface's proposed death, and the sword is comparable to the nation's royal sword, so he knows they are related. Shin sits alone in the garden like a hopeless human wondering why it is so difficult to gather necessary information. Just then, a young beast girl, Millie, stands before him, and she drools over his meatballs. Children sure have a way of making you feel guilty for eating your own food. Shin gives her one and she eats it voraciously. Shin wonders if she is lost because she doesn't seem like a beggar. After Millie finishes eating, she thanks him and calls him a nice guy. Probably the best compliment he has gotten since he appeared in the New World, because children have an affinity for sincerity. Shortly after, the cocky Wilhelm arrives to pick her up. Shin is surprised to see him again, and he asks if she is his daughter. Wilhelm declines, and he explains that she is one of the children at the orphanage home that sneaks out constantly, but he always finds her. Wilhelm announces their departure, but just before they leave, Millie runs up to Shin and she whispers in his ears that he should save a fox in the northern woods. She turns to leave, and she bids him farewell. Later in the day, Shin ponders over what Millie said, and he wonders why she chose him to save them. He decides to go since he is jobless at the moment, and he definitely has no definite direction until Shni returns. Shin's slow-thinking brain finally remembers a way he can communicate with her, so he heads out to the Moon Sanctum. Shin gives Tiara a sword that he had forged with Shni previously, which has limited use to just two of them, or whoever they choose. He drops a message that he would love to meet up with her if she recognizes it. Tiara deduces that it is an ancient and powerful powerful sword but she says she wouldn't want to use it because she fears it may swallow her up. For Shni's student, Tira's confidence is a serious disappointment. Shin breaks down the base materials for her, and Tira looks at him with a flustered look. She concludes that nothing feels normal when he is around. Shin apologizes, but he explains that the sword will make Shni identify him. He drops a letter for her to reach him when she comes. Tira asks him to send one to Shni with it, but he claims he did severally, and it didn't work. They both test the letter to confirm its functionality, and it works. Shin wonders if it is only compatible with someone he has seen in that world. Before he leaves, Tira asks for more letters because she wants to learn magic as an aspiring mage. Shin gives her more letters as payment for helping her drop the message. Shin arrives at the northern woods to save the fox, and he suddenly hears some voices telling him to leave. He detects it to be a barrier, but it does not affect him because he has enhanced his mental interference. He marches forward until he arrives at a shrine. As soon as Shin steps in, he hears shattering sounds, but he still steps forward regardless. He enters the room to see the fox in a magic arc so he carries it, and he cures it. When he steps out, he is surrounded by an army of dead people, but he defeats them with his spear. Just as he tries to leave, he sees two new figures on his status. They turn out to be giant monsters from the statue. The monsters charge at Shin, and he struggles to fight them off because his magic bind has no effect on them. They turn the atmosphere dark with their miasma, which makes it difficult for Shin to determine their attacks. Just when it looks like all hope is lost for him, the fox points his attention to the light radiating from the magic circle it was in. Shin finds it easy to defend himself and fight against them from there, until he attains victory. After their defeat, the miasma clears, and he decides to take the fox to Millie. He finds out that the fox is an elemental that used to be one of the top-tier monsters in the new gate game, but he is surprised that it doesn't look humanoid or gigantic. Shin confirms that the monsters he encountered have never appeared in the game so they could be his way back to his world. Shni receives the letter from Tira, and she realizes it contains a message from Shin, her master. Shin walks out of the woods and on his way, he decides to report the large number of skull faces he defeated at the guild but he intends to keep Elementale's identity hidden. He proposes forming a contract with it to keep its level and species hidden while they stay together at all times. The Elementale agrees to form the contact. Afterward, Shin names it Yuzuha, which it also agrees with. Just then, Shin receives a letter from Tira saying she has gotten across to Shni. He sends his greetings across to her. Shin arrives at the guild to report his encounter, and he meets the twins who argue over who should take their report. Shin is certainly one handsome man to have the two beauties argue over who should attend to his coward act. On his way, out, he stops to take another job, and he spots a job description that says a skill successor is needed. He notices that it is an unranked job from the church orphanage, so he decides to go over to the orphanage since he originally wanted to see Millie, and he wants to learn of her power. Upon his arrival at the church orphanage, the nun walks about to him, and she ushers him in to see Millie with a scornful glare that could make anyone think Shin insulted her ancestors. Millie runs to meet him excitedly, causing the nun to loosen up and accept that he is not a villainous scumbag to have been accepted by Millie who rarely likes anyone. Shin introduces himself 
to the nun, while she introduces herself as Tria. Shin asks Millie if Yuzuha is the fox she was speaking about and she affirms. Shin also tells Yuzuha to thank Millie because she told him of her location. Yuzuha bows in appreciation for Millie. Tria and Shin talk about the skill successor job request. Tria explains that she needs someone who inherited the purify skill and can teach it to her. Shin claims the job is a tough ask, while Tria is excited that he has access to someone with the skill. Shin tells her in exchange for teaching her, he wants information about Millie's powers, and he wishes to know any new information that pops up in the church. It may appear that part of being an adventurer is knowing how to make selfish bargains. The innocent nun gets lost in her thoughts because Shin is a stranger, and she may be at a loss with his overwhelming request. Millie's opinion, telling the nun that Shin is good, makes her accept his terms. Tria tells Shin that Millie's power is called the Star Composer because she sometimes has unexpected visions, and she has never been wrong about it. That poor girl certainly deserves a shrine to her name because she possesses powers that people pay hefty money and they struggle to access. Shin confirms that she can predict the future so he tells Tria to protect her identity because there are people who would want to use it for nefarious purposes. Tria claims she has warned her associates from speaking about it, and there is an adventurer that protects them. Shin detects the adventurer to be Wilhelm, and he agrees to take the job. Tria says another sister, the daughter of the former priest, would be in the best position to learn the skill. Shin is convinced that the situation is sticky. Shortly after, Shin and Millie sit down to watch the children jealously while they play with Yuzuha. Millie devises a wicked trick that sends Yuzuha away from them, and she plays with her alone. Just then, another young orphan girl walks to Shin, and she asks if he is the one the nun said would save them. She explains that a new priest is bound to come, and he intends to get rid of the orphanage because they don't like him. Shin asks why Tria can't take over as the priest. The girl explains that the position requires someone to have a special skill which Tria doesn't have, but she is considering Lysia, the priest's granddaughter. Shin realizes the reason why Tria needs the skill successor. Millie assures the other girl that Shin will save them, and she believes because Millie tends to be right. Shin pats Millie's head adorably, and the other children get jealous. Not long after, Tria comes out to call Shin, and she sees him babysitting all the children in his arms. A fearless hero, and now a babysitter, Shin must have probably mastered the art of toddler negotiations alongside his fighting skills because he is so perfect at it that he could pass off for Mary Poppins' male version. Shin meets up with Lasia, who talks clumsily and awkwardly for an aspiring church leader. However, Tria assures him she will learn, despite her clumsiness. Shin begins by asking about the location where large numbers of high-level undead appear. Tria replies, saying the ghost planes are the most famous places to find them. Just immediately Wilhelm, the cocky dude comes in, and he realizes that Shin is the adventurer who took the request. After extending their greetings to him, Wilhelm asks Shin what he is after, and what he is told. Shin answers him sincerely, causing Wilhelm to scold Tria for being trusting. Tria explains that Shin doesn't seem like a bad person to her, and Millie also approves of him. When Wilhelm asks Millie if she trusts him and she agrees, Wilhelm realizes he has no choice but to trust him too. Wilhelm threatens Shin with his blade in case he makes the wrong move, but Millie calms him down and they apologize for his short temper. Wilhelm proceeds to ask Shin about the Purify skill. Shin explains that acquiring the Purify skill requires defeating 200 undeads that are over level 150, while holding an item called the Holy Prayer Orb. He plans to weaken the monsters while Latsia polishes them off. According to him, acquiring the orb is the most difficult part, but luckily for her, he has one she can use. Tria wonders how he can talk about killing monsters with such comfort. Latsia, in her case looks startled until Wilhelm jolts her out of her thoughts. Wilhelm proposes coming with them, and Shin agrees with it. Wilhelm claims he doesn't know much about him, but he will accept that he is not dangerous, because Millie likes him. While Shin leaves the church, his path crosses with Wilhelm, who asks him to follow him. Wilhelm intends to ask Shin a bunch of stupid questions, just to satisfy his trust-issue-based curiosity. He questions if Shin is a chosen one who was born with skills, titles, and knowledge he shouldn't have. Shin declines, and he wonders if reincarnation still works in the system. Wilhelm finds him thinking, so he promises not to make him divulge what he doesn't wish to. He also advises him not to mention the Chosen Ones outside because not many people know about it. They both chat for a moment, and it leads Shin to conclude that he is a nice guy, contrary to what people think. Shin receives a message from Tira, saying she has received a response from Shni, and she says she will come when she's done with work. Tira wonders what Shin did to Shni, because she asked her several questions that scared her. He receives a letter of introduction, and Wilhelm shows off his own too. They arrive at the Ghost Plain Woods, where the monsters they intend to defeat are situated, Shin hands over the prayer orb to the nervous Latia, and they walk in. 
they defeat the first set of monsters, and Lachia gives them a landing blow that increases her skill level. They continue with different monsters in the woods, and they split their attacks. Meanwhile, Lady Rion and her subordinates are also fighting off some skull-faced jacks in the ghost plane according to the information she heard. She defeats the skull face seamlessly with the sword that flew into the palace before like a predator pouncing on its prey. Her fearlessness is certainly unmatched. Her subordinate tells her he is worried about the other group, which she agrees that she is too. Another one of her subordinates offers to handle it, and she leaves to the other group to help them defeat the skull face they have been struggling with. The subordinate turns out to be Shni. Shni heals everyone and they thank her for assisting them because they already considered retreating. The team leader introspectively admits that he is surprised about Shni's ability to take down a monster alone that they have refused to defeat in groups. It is very obvious he substituted his ability to fight for his blabbermouth because he should be impressed with her skills not questioning her prowess. He claims he should have expected as much from someone who once earned a high human's favor. Shni tells them she will continue scouting the area for more Skullface and she asks them to reach her with the magic item she gave them if they come across any more danger. Shni speeds off into the deeper woods, and she anticipates seeing her master after all this while. While they are still in the sealed area of the woods, Wilhelm defeats the last of the monsters, and Lachia finally attains the Purify skill level. Wilhelm distracts Lachia when she gets lost in her thoughts, trying to imagine ways she can use the Purify skill to help the orphanage. Lachia has suddenly gained a tangible amount of confidence for someone who was so scared that she could almost shit in her pants initially. She expresses her glad Suddenly, Shin hears a strange sound, and he looks to see a sensation in the sky. Wilhelm recognizes it as the magic matter that animates the undead. The magic matter transforms into a very large skull-faced lord with a skill level of 804 that could destroy the entire nation. Suddenly, the skull-faced lord jumps up in an attempt to break the seal hovering over the woods. Wilhelm confirms that the seal has been broken with just that one punch from the skull-faced lord. The skull-faced lord notices them, but Shin ignores his fearless warrior title this time, and they run for their lives. However, its howling stops them from leaving. Just then, more skull face monsters appear before them, and Wilhelm suggests that they break through them and flee. Shin disagrees, saying he can't let that amount of monsters roam free. He summons a unique skill that causes Wilhelm to stare at him surprisingly, and he wonders how he got that much power. He tells him he has more explanation to do when they return. Shin clears a path for Wilhelm to leave with Latsia, while Yuzuha insists on staying with him. Shin commences by clearing off the monsters around with Yuzuha's impressive foxfire. However, the skull face lord howls again, and more monsters appear. Shin clears only a little amongst them out, and he laments about not having Shni around because she would have provided more options for him to fight against them easily. Suddenly Shin spots a blue marker on his detector which signifies the arrival of an ally. He makes a quick detour and heads toward the direction of the blue marker until he finds Shni. Shin stares at her like an embarrassed fool who just met his childhood crush, but a cat has his tongue, and he can't seem to spur even a sentence out. After the staring contest that seems like it may never end, Shin eventually voices out a cliché statement, and he asks how she is faring. The skull Face Jacks appear again. Yuzuha understands the situation, so she immediately creates a barrier for them. As soon as Shin turns back, he receives a warm embrace from Shni. He apologizes for leaving her behind, and he also thanks her for staying at the shop, but Shni tells him she wants to hear something different. Shin considers deeply what he should say instead, but his inexperience reflects itself this time. He eventually tells her now that he is back and she welcomes him back. Shin says ending the death game should have wiped his saved data, including the Moon Sanctum, Shni, and his other followers, but the situation is different. Suddenly Yuzuha's barrier falls off and the Skullface Lord appears. Shin tells Shni they will catch up later, but they need to defeat the Skullface Lord first. Shin and Tria combine their strengths to generate an attack like the old times. The spell creates a boundary in the sky that erases the Skullface Jax while the Skullface Lord gets weak. Shin cuts it off immediately, and it falls down heavily, but Shin hears a voice from the Skullface Lord saying it wants his power which surprises him. Shin picks up the gem and he complains about not learning something after the defeat. Shin proposes chatting together with Shni for a while so they sit and he narrates his experience from the time he defeated Origin to his appearance in the present time. Shni realizes that is what truly happened because the dungeon disappeared with him after he left. She says other support characters mentioned that their masters had left the game and they thought they should have disappeared alongside him. However, they had to split themselves up so they could work out things separately, hence why she chose the Moon Sanctum. Shin tells her his research is aligning gradually. He instructs her to stop calling him master because it could cause a fuss if anyone knew he was superior to someone as strong as her. Shni blushes like a hopeless fool in love when she calls his name due to her unfamiliarity with it. When she asks what they would do next, Shin considers visiting the site he read about in the research library. Shni asks him if he would return home if he ever found a way to leave the game world. Shin is one idiot who knows how to seriously break a woman's heart. He tells her sincerely that he would, and she looks disappointed in a way, but she lets it go. 
Shin asks her how much she remembers about the world, and she tells him everything from the day they landed. She implores him not to tell her to forget, and he agrees. Shin realizes that his support characters have always known they would disappear, but they said nothing because they knew it would trouble him. Shin claims he now has to second-guess his decision after realizing that they knew. After their conversation, Shin suggests having a party when they return to the Moon Sanctum. Shni asks Shin who Yuzua is, and he explains how he came about her. When he mentions that she is an elementale, she confirms that she is not an ordinary spirit with her tail. Shin lifts Yuzua to check out her tail, but he is surprised when she speaks out. Yuzua explains that her head cleared off when the Skullface Lord disappeared. Shin recalls that it was the Skull Faces that surrounded the shrine before too, so there must be a connection. Shin tells her not to speak when they are out, while Shni talks about her growing three tails that would attract attention. Shin tells Yuzuha to transform her tails into one, and she does so instantly. Shni looks at them adorably, and she pets Yuzuha too. She claims Shin is full of surprises because it is very random for anyone to tame an elemental effortlessly. Shin mentions that they need to get going because he sent his companions out first, and he doesn't want anyone reporting the situation to the guild. Shni says he could have postponed their chat if that was the case, but Shin says he couldn't hold it after seeing her face. They speed off after Wilhelm and Lacia hoping they would catch up with them since they are faster. While Wilhelm and Lacia run off, they notice a movement, and he gets set to attack the proposed monster but he is angry when he finds out that it is Shin and Shni. The royal guards and Lady Rion find the demarcation Shin had created with his sword, after observing what went down with the light and they were also healed after. One of the guards finds a sword that belongs to Shin, and he deduces from the bird carving that the most skilled blacksmith carved it, the High Human. Lady Rion says she didn't know High Humans still existed, and her subordinate, Gadras, replies that only a High Human would be insane enough to treat such a weapon as disposable. Lady Rion confirms that the High Human owns the Moon Sanctum, so she proposes going there when they return. She intends to challenge the High Human to a duel, but Gadras advises her against attacking her carelessly. Wilhelm, in his case, forces Shin to spill the truth about his identity. Shin tries to attach the victory to Shni, but Wilhelm tells him they saw everything clearly, and he threatens him with his venom blade until Wilhelm confesses that he is a high human. Wilhelm is surprised about it, and they discuss the legacies he left behind that people still worship. Shin also tells Wilhelm that he is a blacksmith, and he offers to help him fix his blade. What can this hero not do, really? A glorified, overpowered perfectionist who is too perfect for reality, so he has to be stuck in the game world. Lacia wakes up from her sleep, and she worries about him despite seeing that he looks fine. She questions who Shni is, and they introduce her as the Shni Rizar. Lacia blushes stupidly after realizing who she is, and she expresses her adoration for her. Lacia suddenly feels sick and they decide to part ways at the gate where Wilhelm insists that Shin is done with his duty so he can handle leave while he handles the rest. Shin hands him a letter so he can reach out to him whenever things go south. Wilhelm tries to reject the letter. He explains that whatever would make him call out to Shin means he is in a very desperate state and Shin would be getting dragged into a seriously dangerous situation. Shin realizes that Wilhelm is desperately trying not to involve outsiders in the church affairs, but Wilhelm insists. He says he wouldn't feel comfortable knowing he abandoned the first friend he made in the present world, and the children he is trying to protect. Shin tells him to accept it because he is getting embarrassed about it. Shin's words get Wilhelm emotional, and he assures him he won't have any restraint. Shni looks at Shin with adoration, and she claims he has not changed. According to her, he is still the same Shin who never boasted of his almighty strength while protecting the weak equally. They return to the Moon Sanctum, and Tira runs into Shni happily. She tells her ecstatically about the one that asked of her, but she is surprised to see them together. When Tira questions why they are together, Shin tells her it is a long story, and they need to eat first. Shni agrees with him, but Tira is surprised that they have to eat together. Shni explains that it is only natural because Shin owns the Moon Sanctum. Tira's face reflects shock when she hears Shni's words. She recalls that the Moon Sanctum owner is a legendary high human, so she didn't expect Shin to be one. She apologizes after recalling some of the not-so-welcoming comments she said to him. Tira hopes Shin won't throw her out, which he certainly won't do being the Mr. Nice Guy he is, and also considering his unique connection with beauties like her. Shni cooks a nice meal for them with a combination of monster flesh and some wild plants. The almighty Shni cooking for a man even though he is her master reflects how much influence Shin really has on her, and it is certainly not just duty. Shin drools over it while Tira finds everything absurd, but in the end, they induce her into their wizardry as she joins them to eat the the strange combination happily. Shin asks about the other support characters, and Shni tells him they are all living on their own terms because they decided not to fret when he disappeared. Shin agrees it would be a burden if they were truly out looking for him. Just then, 
Tira teases Shin in a way that shows she is drunk. Shni decides to take her in, and she apologizes for her actions while Shin laughs amusingly. The sight of a drunk beauty truly amuses the soul. Shin visits his old bedroom, and he admits that it hasn't changed. He finds Yuzuha already sleeping, so he also gets in bed. Shortly after, he feels another sensation by his side so he turns to find Shni lying beside him, and he stares in shock. She calls him master, with tears dropping down her eyes, and Shin apologizes within himself to her for making her feel that amount of pain. The next morning, Shin wakes up to a very big shock when he finds that Yuzuha has transformed into a human form. She embraces him happily but he implores her to get dressed because he is too embarrassed to see her naked. He hands her a dress that Elementales wear in their human forms in the game. Shin steps out together with Yuzuha in her red hakama. Shni compliments her outfit, and she offers to set up another table for her. After they finish eating, Shin asks Yuzuha a series of questions about why she was at the shrine. Yuzuha explains that she stopped a natural disaster from happening with all her energy, and she felt really weak afterward, so she decided to sit in the shrine because it was the place she felt the least uncomfortable in. However, she was on the verge of dying. Shin realizes that he came in just in time because of Millie's help. Yuzuha says she would visit Millie to thank her, and Shin proposes giving her a gift. Shni suggests the elven baked bread Tiara makes. During their conversation, Shni tells Shin there is someone she wants him to meet as soon as possible. When Shin asks who and Shni tells him Gerard, he stares in shock because it has been 500 years since the Dusk of Prosperity. He says high beasts like him only have 150 years to live at the most. Shni tells him he doesn't have many days to live and has been waiting for him. Shni tells Shin that Gerard reunited the beast tribes and formed the Farnid Beast Alliance, so they called him the First Beast King. She adds that the current king is the 8th Beast King who possesses all the military might and abilities of a leader that has allowed Gerard to wait for him peacefully. Shin decides to go and see him. He considers traveling normally since he is not in any immediate danger. He confirms if they are both ready to leave the next day and Yuzuha affirms while Tiara says she will watch the shop as usual. Shni disagrees with her. She instructs Tiara to come with them because they no longer have to be particular about the location since Shin is back. Shin tells her they will take the shop with them so she doesn't have to bother about it. Tiara accepts the offer ecstatically and Shin instructs them to start preparing. Shni takes permission to act independently for a while because she wants to report the Skullface situation to the kingdom. Shin also proposes forging the swords for their inventory before heading to the guild to take a new job for a higher rank. Shni proposes forming a party so they can use telepathy to communicate with each other when they need to assemble. Shin forms the party immediately while Shni advises Tiara to register as an adventurer at the guild. Shin asks her to go together with him, so she proposes wearing something more appropriate. Shin heads out to the forge to make new swords, and he does them seamlessly until Tiara appears. She claims she struggled to pick a dress because it had been a while. They both head out to the guild together with Tiara feeling enthusiastic about going out. Tiara is excited to see the large crowd in the town, and she acts just like a child visiting the amusement park for the first time. He tells her they need to run their errands first, so they can have enough time to explore. She agrees with him and she drags him along to the guild unconsciously. Shin stops her on the way to ask if she knows where the guild is since she has decided to take the lead. She stops instantly, and she blushes embarrassingly like a dunce when she realizes her mistake. He takes her hand to lead her toward the right way. When they arrive at the guild, Cecilia shows Shin his newly updated rank. He wonders why his rank was increased when he hasn't completed anyone's job, and she explains to him that his battle with the Skullface helped him level up. She thinks he should have even been promoted to an A rank, but the other adventurers wouldn't take such a big promotion kindly. Cecilia asks if he knows who Tiara is, and he explains that they are traveling together on mutual business. Cecilia displays her jealousy like a typical housewife who spots her husband with his lover, but she can only complain. Cecilia has even received information about them holding hands like couples, so her crush on Shin must be strong. Shin's chokehold on these ladies needs to be studied. Shin realizes he must have triggered something, so he instantly changes the topic. He asks if she has any information on the sacred sites that were destroyed during the Dusk of Prosperity. Cecilia may be a foolish lover girl, but she certainly does her job adequately. She immediately switches to work mode upon Shin's question, and she tells him information about it cannot be displayed to anyone below rank B. Shin concludes that he will return when he is leveled up. He questions if there are any jobs along the way to Farnid. Cecilia opens the guild book to check, and she sees a job where someone is requesting a wagon escort to Bayrun's staging post. She gives them the expected time they would meet up with them. Shin tells Tiara they can wander through the town on their way to the church, since her guild card will take a while to get ready, and they are not meeting for the job until afternoon. They both explore places and they have fun alongside Yuzuha until they arrive at the church. They find Latsia outside and she expresses her admiration for Tiara when she realizes that she is Shni's student. She asks her a series of endless questions about being Shni's student. 
They finally enter the church where Millie plays with Yuzua happily, and she thanks Shin for helping them keep the orphanage. Lacia also says she would be appointed as the next head of the church because of Shin's help. Shin waves the appreciation off, and he asks about Wilhelm. Tria explains that Wilhelm went after the priest who wanted to take over the church to investigate him because he thought he would not back down so easily. Shin agrees with Wilhelm's decision to investigate the priest. He gives them a bracelet enchanted with different magic for their protection, and they thank him for his help. Just immediately, the children arrive in the room to find him, and they look excited. Tiara, in her case, is drowning in their excessive love, which still feels super new to her for someone who has been inside all her life. Shortly after, Tira and Shin bid them farewell, and they return to the guild where Cecilia gives Tira her guild card. Shin takes Tira up to an alley, and he holds up a crystal that Tira gushes over. He explains to her that the crystal is enchanted with a teleport spell, and it instantly warps one to a saved location, so he intends to use it to get them to Moon Sanctum. Tira admits that everything he brings out of his pocket is always extraordinary. She sounds more impressed when Shin tells her he can make many more as long as he has the materials. Shin confirms that the coast is clear, so they warp themselves to the Moon Sanctum, where Shin transforms the Moon Sanctum into a pendant. They proceed to the carriage for the job where they meet the other two adventurers that would be working with them. The first adventurer introduces himself as Gay and he looks super cool. However, the second adventurer, a young red-haired girl, Tsubaki, jumps down from the top of the carriage, and she looks so stern that she seems like she would beat Sheena up any chance she gets. The merchant whom they would be escorting finally arrives, and he seems like a cheerful soul, contrary to what anyone would expect of a wealthy merchant. The journey begins immediately, and they ride in silence. In the Berelict Palace, the news of the disappeared Moon Sanctum reaches the king, and he considers it to be an issue for the kingdom. Feeling bothered over a property they do not own or have access to, smells like witchcraft, but it wouldn't even be strange if Beirelicht was practicing it. They receive intel that Shni is also coming to the palace, so they hope she will arrive within the day. The princess implores her father to stay calm because Lady Rion has also not returned to give them the full details, so they don't have enough information to act. In the carriage, Shin and the others discuss their strengths and what they are skilled in to know how to distribute themselves if a fight ensues. Gaian is an A-rank adventurer who has no magic skills, but is a skilled samurai. Tsubaki is an E-rank adventurer who is especially skilled skilled in boxing and can cast some spells to boost her speed. Sheena and Tiara also introduce themselves and their ranks. Gaian talks about Hinamoto, the island where most samurais are from, that was created by a natural disaster. From Gaian's explanation, Shin claims he can't believe there is a whole country based around guilds from the New Gate game. Finally, a detail that feels strange to Mr. Know-it-all, meaning he is not so perfect after all. Sheena thanks Gaian for the information. Suddenly the carriage comes to a halt, and they step down to find some bandits with exaggerated sneers asking the merchant to give them his money and cargo. Shin tells Nak to enter the carriage while Yuzuha guards him. Shin and Gaian decide they won't strike until the bandits make the first move. Tiara remembers Gaian's question asking her if she has ever killed someone. She says she has no choice but to do it now, or the others would be in greater danger. The bandit leader threatens Shin and Gaian to leave Tsubaki with them so they can have fun with her. Shin gets angry with their words, and Tiara admits that she doesn't like his bloodlust. She notices the other bandits hiding in the bush, so she concludes that she has to kill them. Gaian unsheaths his sword, and he advises them to leave first, but they refuse to listen. The bandit leader claims he knows Gaian has E-rank and lower adventurers with him, so they are not afraid of them. Shin wonders where they got the information from, and Tsubaki proposes beating them out of it. While the bandits are still laying out their plans to kill them, Tiara shoots at the bandits hiding in the woods, and it surprises them. They begin their attacks on each other, and Shin's team beats up the bandits seamlessly with everyone showing their unique skills. The bandit leader is surprised to see them winning when they have magic swords, and their levels are higher as well. Shin approaches him, and he breaks his sword. He beats him up severely, but the bandit leader still has the guts to make threats. Shin commands him to confess where he got the information. Just then, Tira calls out to him and she embraces him. Tsubaki is confused about Tira's reason for doing that, but Tira leaves when she confirms that he is back to his normal self. She turns away shyly after realizing what she just did. In her defense, she claims she did it because he seemed cold and dark earlier. The embrace is a remedy her master uses to calm her down, so she uses it for him without considering it properly. Gain confirms that the bandits attempted to raid the wagon for goods that were connected to the church, but they were not informed about what exactly was in it. The bandits' intention was to kill them and make away with the cargo. Shin suddenly remembers that Tria said they needed official authorization from the church headquarters before appointing the next priest. Shin wonders if someone is trying to prevent that, but he concludes that escorting the wagon is a good choice, even though it is a coincidence. They finally arrive at Byrune, and Nock hands over their certificate of completion to them happily, ecstatically. Their protection gives him a sense of pride, and he displays his happiness like a dog wagging its tail after seeing its owner. He promises to hire them when he is traveling again. After turning in their certificate to the guild, 
Gaian tells Shin they will be heading over to Kilmont, while Shin's direction is Farned. Gaian says they would certainly see again if it's meant to be, and they bid each other farewell. Shin proposes buying a wagon because he finds traveling with it pretty comfortable. Shin should certainly be classified as a rich and eligible young bachelor for considering buying a wagon so easily without worrying about his pocket. They head out to a wagon shop, and Shin suggests modifying his own wagon to make it easier to travel with. Tiara argues with his decision, but she eventually succumbs to his interest. Shin decides to buy a wagon that is big enough for him to sleep in. Talk about pride and class. He spots a wagon that fits his description, and he books for it. The salesman advises him to get a very strong horse that fits the wagon because of its heaviness. Shin asks about using monsters to pull the wagon according to what he heard. The salesman claims he has heard the rumors too and he thinks it is possible since the monsters are stronger, but he would have to tame one first. After they step out, Shin considers having Yuzua transform into a stronger monster if they get desperate. Just then, he receives a telepathy alert from Shni. Shni informs him she has left the kingdom, and she is now heading towards them. She offers to help Shin capture a monster that can drive the wagon when he tells him of their situation with the wagon. As expected of a responsible and loyal sidekick, she tells him she will arrive in Beirun within a day, so she implores him to hold on for him, which he agrees to do. Shni tells him the castle is very concerned about the disappearance of the Moon Sanctum, and they looked pale about it. However, Shni thinks it will do them good, because she was getting tired of their incessant flattery while they were trying to recruit her with them. Shin admits that any country that intends to bolster its military would definitely want her in their ranks. Shni affirms, and she tells him one country even tried to claim ownership of the Moon Sanctum, while another proposed marriage to her. Shni claims she considered eradicating the whole country out of annoyance at the time. Shin realizes that Shni is a total knockout now, and she is more popular than he expected, even though he made her that way. Shni teasingly asks if he is jealous, and he affirms, but his jealousy is certainly not the type that Shni wants him to have. Shin's radar can detect the enemy's ambush from miles away but it fails spectacularly when it comes to his emotional intelligence. Shin should really recalibrate his emotional sensors. Shni smiles, and they eventually end their conversation. Shin turns to Tira, who had been admiring some artifacts all the while. Shin tells her they need to find an inn, and the seller recommends one for them. Shin and Tira arrive at the inn, and they find it to be very gigantic. They eventually pay for a room, and it turns out to be so expensive that it consumes half of their reward. After entering the room, Shin admits that the room is truly luxurious because of the ambiance and setup. Yuzuha jumps in excitedly, and she transforms into her human form. Shin decides to do maintenance on his tools. Shortly after, Tiara arrives in the room, and she asks if Shin told Shni where they are staying in the city. Shin affirms, and he tells her she will be arriving the next day. After she confirms her doubt, Shin proposes they have dinner in the room. After dinner, Shin proposes having his bath before going to bed. Tiara considers doing the same thing as well. Yuzuha suggests having her bath with Tiara, and she drags her into Shin's bathroom where she teases Tiara loudly. Shin decides to distract himself from their noise by watching the moon. Shni finds a monster that she intends to catch for the wagon. The next day, Shin heads out to start his modification on the wagon, and Tiara follows him alongside Yuzuha. Shin starts by using a creator skill for working metal to alter the axles to stop them from shaking. Tiara looks surprised, and she tells him that his modifications are too fast. He decides to do the next one in a more conventional way, but Shin receives a telepathy alert from Shni and she informs him that she has arrived in the woods behind the north gate. Shin decides to work on the wagon faster even though he had planned to go the conventional way. He arrives at the woods with Tiara and Yuzuha. Tiara and Yuzuha notice a presence in the wood, and they bring Shin's attention to it, but he assures them they will understand soon. They eventually arrive at a spot where they find a very scary-looking giant monster with a skill level of 7 Harmafei 1. Shni appears, and she tells Shin it is the monster she fetched for him for the movement of the wagon. She assures him it would do the job. When Shin asks where she found the monster, she explains that she saw it at a nearby sacred mountain. The monster cuddles up to Tira surprisingly, and Shin considers that it may be the friendly type, but Tira, with no ounce of bravery in her, acts like a scared cat and insists that it isn't her problem. Shin tells her they are stuck with him so she has no choice. He turns to ask Shni why she chose the monster. Shni says she knew the monster they would use had to be in a sacred beast class. She instructs the monster to reduce its size when Shin teasingly complains that it is too big. They express their surprise about its shrinking, and Shni says it can even go smaller in case they need to stay in inns. Shin confirms that her selection is thoughtful, while Tira admits that they are both crazy for carrying on like it is no big deal. Shni's face expresses sadness when she realizes they are not so impressed by her choice, but Shin waves it off, and he claims he finds it cool to have a sacred beast pull its wagon. Yuzuha and the monster communicate with with each other, while Shni tells them the monster's name is Shimmer. Shortly after, they commence their journey, and Shimmer speeds off. 
Tierra and Schnee commend the wagon's comfortability compared to other ones they have been in, including the royal ones. They accord comfort to the modifications Shin made. On their way, Shimmer tells Yuzua about his childhood, when his mother was attacked by an adventurer on the sacred mountains, but an elf girl saved him. It turns out that Tierra is the elf girl that saved him when he was young. Tierra also remembers saving a puppy 100 years ago and she expresses her surprise to find out that he is now more grown. Shni suggests that Shimmer and Tira form a contract together, and she offers to dissolve her own contract with Shimmer for her. They carry on with their plan, and Tira feels weak from forming the contract so they decide to rest for the night. While they rest, Shni and Shin discuss Tira's contract. Shni confirms that she made them form the pack so Shimmer can always help Tira when she is not around her and she is in danger. They finally arrive at the southeastern Farnid, where Girat's grandchildren come to receive them. They usher them to the room where Girat is, and Girat expresses his joy to see his master before he dies. Girat introduces the young man from before as the current king of beasts, Wolfgang alongside his daughter, Kuore. He also introduces his most trusted confidants, Van Ku and Rajik Dolk. Girart tells Shin to speak normally, and Shin claims Girart started with the courtesy after calling him his master, which feels strange. Girart teasingly claims he is a dying man, and they haven't seen each other for a long time so he should be allowed to have his fun. Shin and Girart reminisce on their past when they sit together. Shin tells him he already knows he founded a nation according to what Shni said. Girart scolds Shni for leaving him no chance to boast of his accomplishments, but Shni says she mentioned it because she knew he can sometimes be an annoying and exaggerating mother <laughs> Shin laughs amusingly at their childishness while Shni leaves to make tea. Girart asks about Shin's adventures, and he narrates everything to him. Girart realizes his disappearance is the reason he couldn't find him with the effort he expended while searching for him. Girart confesses to Shin that he will die soon, which is probably less than a month. When Shin asks how he found out, he explains that he felt something was off for a few weeks, but he understood it clearly when Shni told him about Shin's return. He confirms that time has started flowing for him again, as though it was awaiting his return. He thinks his prayers have been answered. Girart asks Shin to duel with him to Shin's surprise like a deluded individual. Shin wonders if Girart intends to die in battle as a warrior. Girart introspectively says to himself that he wishes to duel Shin, the strongest warrior, because he wants to know how effective his fangs are against a superhuman. Shin gladly accepts his request, and Shni who has been watching all along turns away sadly. Shin asks if Girart has informed Wolfgang and the others. Girart responds that they know of his life expectancy, but he hasn't told them of the duel yet. However, he thinks his brother-in-arms are aware of his intentions. Shin asks about Wolfgang as the new leader, and Girard admits that he is the best replacement for him because he listens to the people and he understands them. Afterward, Girard calls his brother-in-arms, Wolfgang, and his daughter to inform them of his duel to death with Shin. Quare stands up and lashes out to everyone for staying calm when her grandfather is going to die. Girard explains to her that he has lived a long life and has even watched his companions die alongside their grandchildren. He says he wants them to see the reason why he has lived so long and they will find out when they watch him fight with Shin. Quarry sits down weakly, and they all agree to his final decision when he claims it will be his final and greatest battle in life. Shin sits down alone pondering over Girart's requests. For someone who accepted the dual request so voluntarily, his conscience is definitely not giving him breathing space. He feels bad that Girart requested a duel when he finally got to see him again after a long time. Gerard, in his case, sits down outside, and he thanks Shin and his thoughts for coming back and accepting his offer. He claims he has always admired him so he felt regret when Shin disappeared and he gave up on his wish, but now it will be fulfilled. The following day, Shin helps Girart modify his fighting gears in the Moon Sanctum, and Girart thanks him for it happily, like a toddler who just received a gift. It is now a day to the duel day, and Girart asks Shin about Shni. He asks if Shin would return to his home if he found a way to go, and if he would take Shni along. Shin tells him after hesitating for a while that he wants to go home, and it is the reason why he has kept fighting consistently. He apologizes to Girart for disappointing him, but Girart apologizes for being intrusive. Girart reminds Shin he used to call himself an opportunist whenever he faced trouble, because he always wanted everything to go his way, so he could reach a happy ending where everyone lived happily ever after. Girart jokingly says it is not something they would get to enjoy, so he looks forward to their fight. The following day, Shin, Girart, Shni, and the others ride the wagon to the fight location with Girart feeling so ecstatic. Girart is one weird fellow, because who feels happy about going to die? He sure must have certainly lived a good life. Shin instructs Shni to restrain any flying attacks during their strike and she agrees to his bidding. Girart, in his case, bids his family goodbye, and they promise him to live a reputable life. Van Koo claims he has never seen Girart so happy since they met because he has been grinning so badly. Shin and Girart head out to the secluded woods for their fight, and the fight commences with their loud shout. They both fight against each other and they cause commotion in the woods with their intense blasting. 
Girart claims the fight reminds him of their experience 500 years ago, and Shin agrees that it does. A wild explosion in the woods causes Wolfgang to comment that he didn't realize the first king, Girart, had such immense strength. Schnee says they just completed their warming up, and Tira is surprised that they have still not used their full powers. Tira asks if Schnee is as strong as they are, but she claims she would struggle with Girart in a fight which makes Tira conclude that Schnee is also strong. In the woods, Girard admits that all the techniques he developed are useless, but he expects nothing less from his master. Shin tells him he knows Girard is not expending all his energy, so Girard decides to put everything on the line henceforth. Girard transforms into a gigantic single fang monster, which surprises Shin. He recalls Shin saying he wouldn't use the title he acquired from defeating the final boss, because he doesn't wish to rely on such unfair abilities to win. Gerard admits that he would do something similar if he were in Shin's shoes, but he wants to fight Shin at his full power, even if it means wiping him off in the blink of an eye. Gerard sets out to attack Shin, but Shin gives him a defensive electrifying attack that Gerard dodges. Just as he almost hits Shin at his back, Shi restrains it, and he admits that Gerard must have trained incredibly to develop his new strength. Shin decides to fight with his full strength when he sees that Gerard is fighting with all his might, but he isn't doing anything. Just then, Gerard retreats back weakly, after almost giving Shin a hit, and he confirms that it is the end. Shin commends him for almost getting him at the end, and Gerard tells him he didn't survive for 500 years for nothing. Girart asks Shin for one last favor, as a reward for landing a blow on him. Shin shows off a very mysterious power-up that no one would have seen coming, and he consumes Girart with it. He lifts him back to the cliff where his family is. Shin tells them not to cry, because Girart landed a blow on a high human, so he leveled up to them before he died, which is something they should be proud of. They move Girart's corpse back to the kingdom, and the whole beast nation mourns his death. They conduct his funeral ceremony the same night. Shortly after, Shni finds Shin brooding, and she embraces him. Shin finally lets his emotions out, and and he admits that it hurts to see a friend die even though it is what Girart wants. Shin sheds tears of regret. Shin in the middle of town alongside Shni and Tira. They are both dressed in beast costumes to conceal the traits of their elf species since their elf nature stands out more. Shin admits that he didn't expect the stuff he made for fun to come in handy. Shni asks Shin what he thinks of her dress. When Shin tells her she looks great, she turns away shyly and announces their departure for their next journey to see someone named Schweid. Tira admits that she has never seen Shni that way, and Shin agrees with her too. Shin says to himself that he didn't expect to see his former support character, Schweid, the high dragnir in Farnid representing Kilmont, an allied nation. Shin, Shni, and Tiara arrive at the mansion where representatives of different nations who came for the funeral ceremony are staying. Wolfgang and Quare lead them in to meet Schweid. Wolfgang decides to leave for a meeting when Schweid's assistant leaves to fetch him, and he implores them to wait. Schweid eventually arrives and he dismisses his assistant when he sees Shin. Just immediately after he steps out, Schweid bows for Shin to his surprise. Schweid expresses his delight about Shin's return, and he promises to be the spear that pierces his foes. Apparently Schweid dismissed his subordinate because he didn't want to be seen in his lousy disciple mode. Everyone has their secrets after all. Shin feels embarrassed, and he tells Schweid to ease up just like he told Shni. Schweid decides to do his bidding, and he questions why Shni is dressed as she is. Shni teasingly says she wore it to suit Shin's taste, but Shin argues against him as a hopeless idiot who can't take a joke. Shin tells him about Girart and how he died with satisfaction. Schweid asks Shin what he intends to do next, and Shin tells him about the sacred site he wants to visit. Schweid agrees to join him after he gets to Kilmont, and he says they will connect through telepathy. Just before Shin leaves, he gives Schweid his personal weapon, Nagizuki. Schweid claims it's been a long time since he held it, and it's the only thing that has felt so natural in his hands. Schweid notices that the weapon even feels more powerful than before. Shin explains that his mana grew five times more since he repaired Girard's fighting gears, so it affected the weapon when he did the maintenance on it. He gloats like a cocky bastard, which is certainly an interesting interesting plot twist for someone who has maintained simplicity despite his incredible strength. Everyone in the room reflects a perplexed expression at him. They all visit the adventurer guild in the nation where Shin picks a job that would level him up to a rank C. He considers making it a day trip, and Quare asks to go with them. She says she would return to continue her investigation on the Ralua forest, where Shin had the duel with Gerard to make sure it's regrowing properly. Shin offers to tag along to check things out since he was involved in the duel, and she approves. They arrive at the woods with the goblins, and they take them out individually. Afterward, they check out the Ralua forest, which has been reinstated to its former nature, but Quarry tells them to weed out unusual plants from the forest. They return to the guild to drop the evidence of their task. At the guild, the receptionist informs Shin that he has a message from Barlux the Beirelicht Guildmaster. Shin informs Shni and Tiara that the Beirelicht castle has requested to see him. When Tiara asks if he did anything that could cause him to be summoned, he remembers the sword that landed in the castle and realizes he may have incurred it on himself. 
Kiera and Shni offer to come along with him while Quare says she can't leave the country. Shin visits Wolfgang before leaving, and he hands over Gerard's fighting gear to him. He says he has changed the owner so Wolfgang can transfer them to whoever he deems fit. Wolfgang is surprised to see the gear because he thought it was destroyed during the duel, but Shin tells him he created it so all he had to do was repair it. He says Gerard also instructed him to hand it over to him. Wolfgang accepts to be the user and he feels the intensity of the gear when he puts it on. Shin and his party depart from Farnid, and they teleport themselves back to the outskirts of Byrelict, where the Moon Castle was formerly. Upon their arrival, Shin notices the location is being watched by people who think the Moon Sanctum would reappear at that spot. Shni claims people's stupidity must have made them forget that the Moon Sanctum is movable. She asks Shin unconsciously if he won't disappear again, and she confesses that she grew nervous because she thought the time would come one day. Shni heads out first to the castle after getting lost in thoughts. Tierra urges Shin to follow through, but he confesses that he could never wait for someone who might never return. Tierra confirms that he can't, because elves and humans have different perceptions of time. She explains that losing their reason to live is like a gateway to hell for long-lived species like them, and thinking about it may get them in trouble, so they have to put their minds to more useful things. Shin finally arrives at the guild where he meets Cecilia and Celia at the reception. They seem excited to have their lost love back, and he asks why the guild master summoned him. Cecilia tells him they have no idea, but she knows he will be summoned because of his extraordinary strength. Cecilia leaves to inform the guild master of Shin's arrival, while Shin discusses his beautiful female acquaintances, and Wilhelm with whom he worked on a job with Cecilia. Everyone in the guild goes silent at the mention of Wilhelm's name because they consider him to be unapproachable. Shin tells them Wilhelm is very simple contrary to what they think, and he tries to defend him further, but Cecilia's arrival cuts him short. She informs him that the masters are ready for him. Shin arrives there, and Barlux introduces him to Arad, the mage who appraises the skull-faced gem he brought in. Arad asks Shin a rather surprising question about the sword that flew into the princess's room. Arad brings a breakdown of the conditions, and it then becomes very evident that Shin is guilty of the crime. Shin realizes he has no choice but to reveal his identity, so he questions how they found out. Arad explains that traces of his mana were left on the sword and the gem, so there was no way the guild could fool them any longer. Barlux tells Shin that it was Lady Rion who summoned him personally, and she gave excuses for him so he wouldn't be punished. However, they claim not to know her true intentions for doing that. Shin reports the situation to Shni and Tira. Shni considers that they might be trying to marry him off to the princess because of his great influence, but she says he cannot accept because they will suffer if he leaves them. Shni suggests introducing her as his fiancée, or Tiara, as his betrothed, just for pretense, and he agrees to follow the plan. The next day, Shin arrives at the castle and he gets ushered in by Gadras, Rion's right hand. Rion introduces herself, and she gets down to business when she shows Shin the sword. Shin identifies it as the skull faces his sword and he tells her the truth about what happened. Princess Rion tells Shin that some people thought he would try to assassinate her, but he seems safe. Shin wonders why she thinks he is safe, when he has not said anything to clear his suspicion. Rion tells him she is going with her instincts, and he has shown his true colors. Shin definitely wants to be painted badly to avoid being recruited, so he expresses his doubt that anyone would want to accept him without more concrete proof. Rion tells him she possesses a skill called intuition, and her hunches have never been wrong. Gadris tells Shin that Rion's strongest conviction was the letter of introduction, which he possesses from the Moon Sanctum. Rion is certain that Shni would never grant anyone with assassination plots the letter of introduction, so it was the final tick for them to proceed. Shin sees he has been defeated now, so he asks them to get down to business. Rion stands up assertively, and she tells him she intends to be direct. Shin considers her moves to be marriage proposals moves, and it causes him to fret. However, Rion disappoints him when she asks him to fight with him. Gadris grabs his head in disappointment. For someone who possesses the skill of intuition, she sure does make some unintuitive choices. Gadris argues with her decision, saying they should discuss before letting him enter their services first. Rion tells him they need to confirm Shin's ability, but Gadris says there are more delicate and considerable ways to go about it. He wonders why the princess demands a fight so easily. Rion concludes that her sister is the ladylike one. Without hesitation, she carries the box with the sword, and she departs for the duel. Gadris is lost for words, but Shin consoles him as a brother who understands his plight. Rion takes them to a room with a teleporting gem, and she tells them they will be teleporting to a place where they can fight to their heart's content. They arrive in a structure that Rion describes as the fight training ground between chosen ones. However, she is uncertain about the other purposes it may have served, because teleportation points are the pre-dusk of prosperity technology, so no one fully understands them. Shin, while thinking to himself, admits that he truly found it strange that they have teleportation points, even though teleportation magic is lost. Rion announces the commencement of their duel, and she tells Shin to select a weapon of his choosing. Shin picks up a small weight sword, 
while Rion selects an incredibly big sword. Rion tells Shin the fight is a test of his ability, so she expects him to put in effort. Shin teasingly tells her to go easy on him. The fight commences, and they both charge at each other. Along the way, Rion lets go of her sword to strike Shin, but he dodges it speedily, and she comments about it. She assures him she won't take it easy on him the next round. Shin decides to adjust his stats to her level, to enable him to fight with a chosen one like her on even terms. Shin takes the first strike this time, but Rion seems stronger than he had thought. She urges him to use his skills to fight as well. Shin uses his flashing vigor skill and Rion also uses the same skill to Shin's surprise. Gadris deduces that there is no difference in their degree of enhancement, but the only thing that may separate them is the simple difference in their abilities. Shin charges toward Rion again, but she hits him before he arrives. He instantly dodges the hit, and he says the princess would be looking at a dead man if he didn't do what he did. Rion concludes that they are both fighters of the same type with similar reaction speeds. Shin agrees with her, and he concludes that the fight won't be easily settled, so he asks them to stop the fight. Rion disagrees with him, and she claims she wants them to keep fighting but Shin shows her that her sword has attained its fighting limit. Gadras admits that Shin's skills supersede Rion's, while his reaction time is also very impressive. Rion realizes she has no choice but to let go so she agrees to conclude the duel. Shin and Gadras are happy about the announcement. Rion asks Shin to serve in their kingdom, but Shin declines the offer because he prefers the free life of an adventurer. Rion gives up on pestering him, but she asks him to inform her if he changes his mind. Shin thanks her, and he questions why she has Skullface's sword, and she didn't use it when she tested him. Rion tells him it is customary in their kingdom for a man to give a woman a sword when proposing marriage so she can cut him down with it if he ever becomes unfaithful. Shin admits that the information is unsettling, but Rion tells him the rule is just a formality in the current times. She offers Shin the sword as a gift because it crashed into her bedchamber. Shin worries that it may imply he proposed to her, and Rion fuels his worries by agreeing to it. Shin tries to explain that it was an accident, but she waves it off, saying she has no intention to force the matter. Gadris tells Shin there are people plotting to leverage the incident as a means to arrest him and force him to repay the kingdom by serving them. Shin admits that the sword could have harmed someone even though it was an accident so their consideration is valid. Rion suggests treating it as a tribute instead of a marriage proposal, which will now mean she was officially presented with a powerful weapon, and he can now get the kingdom off his back. She offers to compensate him for the blade from her coffers, and she implores him to let her keep the sword even though they have more to gain from the arrangement. Without hesitation, Shin agrees to her requests, and he says he only wishes to keep working as an adventurer, as he has always been. He tells her that he doesn't need money as repayment for the sword, but he requests access to restricted zones of the magical library. Rion is surprised that access to the magic library is his only request when he can live as he pleases for the rest of his days with the sword's worth. Shin tells him the only thing he needs at the moment is information, because it is the only valid thing to him. They both strike the deal, and they teleport themselves back to the castle. Upon their arrival, they find the security lying on the floor injured. They turn to see the Cardinal Grerel at a teleportation point. Shin deduces that he has been inflicted with charm and confusion, which is very bad. Gadris tries to stop him, but it seems too late because the teleportation gem takes Shin and Rion to an unknown place. They appear in a ruined structure, and Rion identifies it as the Holy Land Kalkia. Shin confirms that they are the only ones who got teleported to the Holy Land. Rion wonders what is happening exactly for a priest as powerful as Grerel to lose his mind. Shin tells her they need to find a way out, so he suggests using telepathy to connect with his party to meet them at the nearest city. Rion tells him the nearest city is the walled city of Valmer, and they would pass through it to Byrelicht. Just immediately, Shin receives a telepathy message from Shni, who sounds so worried about him, but Shin assures her he is fine. She apologizes for being nervous because she thought he had left again when he disappeared so suddenly. Shin tells her what happened, and he concludes that someone is controlling the Cardinal. Shni tells him mind-affecting skills have been ruled out as a taboo for everyone, and even royals could be executed if caught with them. Shin realizes there is someone lurking in the shadows. He says he could teleport out of the Holy Land, but the princess and the royal family will not let him go if they discover his ability to use lost magic. He implores her to handle things in the palace and he suggests they meet up in Valmer afterward. Shni assures the bothered Tierra that Shin is fine, and she instructs her to follow her to the palace for an urgent business. While on their way, Shni tells Tierra that Shin has been caught up in a dangerous situation, and one of the demons is behind it. Yuzuha claims she doesn't like them, and Tierra deduces they are the monsters born from the miasma. Shin explains that they are enemies that make people suffer. The difference between them and other monsters is that they are empowered inside the miasma so they can disguise themselves as monsters while indiscriminately attacking other creatures around them. Shni says the demons are ranked accordingly, but because the demon could control a man, it is likely an intelligent demon from the Count class with a level of 
400 at most, and 300 for the lowest. Tira is bothered that she isn't even up to half of the demon's lowest level, and the demon is still classified as a mid-rank class because she thinks they would be fighting with them, but Shni assures her they will only be observing for the day. They arrive at one part of the royal palace, and Shni uses a concealment spell on them. Shni tells Tira they are sneaking into the palace, and she lifts her up for a quick flight through the walls, causing her to scream loudly. They walk brazenly through the palace hallway unnoticed, and they head into the dungeon where the captured demon is hidden. Shni uses the sleep spell on the guards, and she enters the cell where Cardinal Grerel is locked. The Cardinal recognizes Shni when she removes her concealment spell, and she asks him about the charm and confusion magic that was cast on him. Cardinal Grerel claims he has no memories of when it was cast on him, and all he sees are memory fragments. Shni tells him it is the effect of having two mind-affecting conditions. She assures him the two people that were teleported are safe, and they will return soon. Shni decides to eject the demon from his body. Just immediately, a mighty hideous-looking demon evolves, and Shni studies its level to be 423. She realizes that the demon has a name which makes it intelligent. The demon recognizes her with her physical look. Shni claims the last time she encountered a demon was 500 years ago, but he is as unsightly as ever. The demon expresses its anger because she is always getting in their way. Who knew demons could feel hurt by body-shaming words? He charges at her angrily, but she cuts off all his defenses. The demon asks why she is choosing to protect the human. Grerel and Shni replies that letting him die over false charges would be a shame. She tells the demon that leaving him to run amok will be a disgrace to their moon sanctum. The demon regrows its arm, and he tells Shni that he intends to wipe them out, because the likes of Grerel defeated his kind previously, but it is all in the past now. He tells Shni to join him because the era of man is now declining, but she refuses. The demon asks why she is so determined to scorn them when her master abandoned her, and it is certain that he will never return. The demon tries to stir vengeance in Shni because he is oblivious to Shin's return, but Shni tells him he chose the most unfortunate timing. She claims she was fighting based based on emotions previously, so she switches her swords to a more intense sword, the Blue Moon. Without hesitation, she slashes the demon's head off seamlessly, and she confidently says she doubts she would lose to an elemental with her strength. Shni, Tira, and Grerel walk through the palace hallways with the guards staring at Shni adorably. She enters the meeting room to meet the king and first princess, who are bothered about Rion's disappearance. Shni reports everything that truly happened to them, and she assures them that Shin and Rion are safe. Gadris expresses his happiness while the first princess feels relieved. Grerel apologizes for causing the trouble, but the king assures him he is free since he was under compulsion. Shni advises them to control the information from getting to the public before announcing her departure. On their way out, Shni tells Tiara they are headed to the walled city of Walmer to meet Shin. When Tiara asks if they will be pushing a new wagon, Shni declines saying they would be running. Shni's speed sends Tiara into an overwhelming state despite being on Shimmer's back. She screams for help like a weakling, but she needs to do better if she intends to keep having a crazily strong Shni as her master. Shin and Rion discussing their escape plan out of the Holy Land. Shin asks her for details, and she tells him that the Holy Land is a city that fell during the Dusk of Prosperity. Rion says it's her first time being in the Holy Land, but she heard it takes several Chosen Ones to defeat the monsters that appear in the city. Shin realizes they would need weapons, so Rion shows him the skull face sword she got teleported with. Shin confirms that the sword will be appropriate for her. When Rion asks Shin about his own weapon, he confidently assures her not to bother. Shin tells himself that he can't let Rion know about his strength or the dozens of skills he has or she won't let him go. However, Shin knows that getting out of the Holy Land without indulging his full strength looks like an impossible feat. Rion explains to Shin that the Holy Land has gates in the four cardinal directions. When people from Beirelicht visited the city to inspect it, they came through the south that had a small door with a device for opening and closing it. Superhero Shin assures her they don't need to wander through the city to find the gate. He suggests using a shortcut so he considers climbing the wall. They finally arrive at a high wall surrounding the area. Shin jumps up to find out where they are, but he surprisingly finds himself back on the ground. He tries jumping again, and he faces the same fate. Apparently he jumped to the top of the wall successfully, but he vanished there and he reappeared on the ground. Shin wonders if he is being teleported so he tries jumping from another location but the case is absolutely the same. Shin finally understands what is happening, so he asks Rion to follow him. Shin arrives at another location where he finds a ball of light that has a similar function to an item in the New Gate game. He tells Rion that the entire city must be a dungeon, and it works differently from the standard royal dungeon, because they can only reach this dungeon's exit by following a set of rules and routines. Shin tells her that steering from the designed route would return them back to their previous location, like what happened to him, so their best option is to follow the balls of light and defeat any monsters that appear to them along the way. Rion is glad that Shin got teleported with her because it saves her the stress of cracking up the mystery alone. 
After their chit-chat, they proceed to the Ball of Light so they can be teleported to their next location. Shin suggests testing the teleportation point first, and coming back to meet her when he is certain that the coast is clear. Shortly after, Shin returns, and he assures her that the next location is not far from their current one. He adds that the vicinity is also safe. Rion apologizes for saddling him with such a dangerous role, but Shin tells her he can't let a princess teleport first, and he can escape easily if he teleports into a horde of monsters. It seems Shin's smooth-talking malfunction has been fixed, because his cowardly ass now says impressive and assuring words to the princess. Shin tells himself that he can easily slaughter the monsters even if they are strong as long as he is not being watched. Rion promises to repay his favor, and they both teleport to the next location. Upon their arrival, Shin detects the presence of a monster around the corner, so they run through the ruins until they find a monster that Shin identifies as a ghost-type monster, known as Gilly Ways. According to his deduction, the monster uses the earth and wind magic, so they need to be careful, because it also moves irregularly. The monster releases an unbelievable magical spell that puts the princess in dismay. Shin calms her down, and he offers to handle it, but he gives her the simple task of landing a blow on the monster. With a joint effort of skill casting and sword strikes, they successfully defeat the monster. Rian is surprised that they defeated the monster seamlessly but Shin explains to her that the Skullface's sword she has is enchanted with light, which is Gilly Waze's weakness, so it made its defeat very easy. Rion asks Shin about his sword, and Shin decides to tell her about it. Rion teases Shin for hiding such an impressive weapon, but Shin bails himself out by saying everyone should have one or two cards up their sleeve. However, in Shin's case, he certainly has numerous cards up his sleeve. It turns out Shin has still landed himself in trouble despite his efforts to conceal his skills, because the princess claims she is now more interested in him. While they continue on their route, Rion asks Shin how many monsters he can sense within range. Shin tells her he can sense more than 20, because monsters typically do not leave their territory within a dungeon however, they still can't let their guards down. After walking for a short while, they spot another ball of light close to them and they approach it. However, they run into a gills lie that Shin confirms to be a rather troublesome monster. Rion argues against Shin's words, saying the monster monster shouldn't pose a problem just because it is a large slime. She charges towards it foolishly despite Shin's disapproval, but she gets trapped in it. Shin rushes up to rescue her, and she apologizes for being a careless idiot, which she sometimes acts like. Shin explains to her that the Gilslai are immune to weak attacks, and are also quite intelligent. According to Shin, the monster would keep chasing them if they don't defeat it immediately, so he tells Rion to put on her fighting spirit. Shin charges forward to destroy the monster while Rion destroys its core speedily. Shin commends her for her precision and swift action, but she waves it off. Rion tells Shin he is getting more casual with her, but she is not bothered about it considering their current circumstances. Shin tells her it is just until they leave the ruins, and she agrees. Rion notices that Shin has been looking away from her, so she questions why. She feels greatly embarrassed when she realizes that her clothes have been tattered. Shin gives her a new outfit from his item box, and Rion admits that she didn't expect him to have many items, but Shin says he is always prepared. While they continue their journey, Shin asks if she has any expertise in magical skills, and she responds that she can cast some beginner spells, but she is certain that they will be useless against Holy Land monsters. Shin connects with Shni through telepathy to ask her if it is okay to teach Rion imitation enchantment. Shni gives him the approval even though she wouldn't agree on a normal day, but she says it is an emergency, so the princess needs a method of self-defense. Shin tells Rion, who didn't hear his conversation with Shni, that he wants to teach her some forgery. They commence the teaching, and Rion's face reveals shock when she casts a fire spell and it burns off the rock Shin throws at her. Shin explains that he used the imitation spell, which is a forgery of the real fire enchantment, but it can quickly destroy any weapon that is not legendary. Rion wonders if Shin should be teaching her such a valuable skill. In Shin's defense, he infers that fewer people would fall to monsters if such a skill was widespread, so teaching her is only beneficial and not harmful to him. Rion laments about doing nothing but to take from him just like the case of the sword. She claims the situation is humiliating, but Shin calms her down saying she should be excited about acquiring important information not scowling at him. Rion insists that she doesn't like to take without giving. Shin realizes that she feels truly bad, so he decides to make a request. He implores her to protect her kingdom, her people, and everything she wants to protect. Rion finally feels relieved, and she agrees to grant his request. Shin, in his case, displays his foolery in his mind when he feels relieved about tricking the princess. He claims the imitation enchantments were exploits in the game, but her dejecting look made him lie. They both arrive at a spot close to the exit gate. Just as they try to proceed, Shin feels a sensation that seems as though he is being sucked in. 
Shin assumes that something is drawing him in from the Holy Lands, and he wonders what it could be. Rion senses his curiosity, so she taps him out of his thoughts. Shin concludes that there is no point in being curious, because they can't head back to the heart of the city. They proceed to the gate where they spot a large round egg that Shin assumes to be a monster egg, but Rion disagrees. She says a monster's egg is always concentrated with mana, but this one is not. She admits that she has never seen anything like the egg. Just immediately, the egg breaks, and a large ice griffin emerges from it. Shin realizes that the incoming attack from it will be severe, so he speedily lifts the princess away from the scene. The griffin freezes everywhere to Shin's shock. After finding a safe space to hide, Shin proposes acting as a decoy for the griffin so Rion can strike it from behind. Rion expresses her concern for him, but Shin assures her he will be fine so they both disperse. Shin distracts the griffin by calling out to it. He strikes its forehead with a weapon that causes Rion to question where he got it from. Rion hits it afterward, but she almost loses control when the griffin slaps her with its wings. She concludes that the griffin is still very powerful. Shin's shout distracts Rion as he lands a very mighty flaming strike on the griffin. Shin gloats like a self-assured fighter to Rion about successfully defeating it with his powerful blow. He claims it was possible due to the opening she made. Unexpectedly, the griffin's growl distracts them, and they detect that the griffin has a self-healing and regeneration ability. They both run speedily for safety, and Shin asks Rion for a favor when she asks about the way to defeat it. Shin instructs Rion to find the device needed to open the gate by herself while he distracts the griffin's attention again. When Rion asks what she is looking for, Shin gives her a logical reason, but in truth, his true intention is to prevent Rion from seeing him use his full strength. He assures Rion he can handle the situation when she expresses his concern about him. Shin arrives at the spot, and he summons his full power without restrictions. He commences by slashing the griffin's head, but it regenerates again. Shin decides to make the griffin a test subject to confirm how much of his power he can safely unleash. He looks forward to seeing who can hold out longer. After a while, Rion arrives at the gate while Shin is still stuck with the griffin. He confirms killing it up to 30 times, but it keeps regenerating. Suddenly, a white sphere from the griffin distracts his thoughts and it draws him closer. Shin recognizes the feeling from before, but he strikes the sphere with his blade. However, he is more surprised when he discovers that the sword has absorbed his attack. He decides to charge in to know what it is about, even though it is a risky move. Shin suddenly gets engulfed in a golden light with the feeling of being sucked leaving his body, so he decides to give killing it another shot. This time, Shin strikes it more intensely, and the griffin stops regenerating until it explodes completely, causing Shin to wonder what truly happened. Rion arrives, and she calls out to Shin. She questions where the griffin is, and Shin informs her he obliterated it without a trace. They finally leave the Holy Land, and they head towards the direction of Valmer to meet Shin's companions. Shni receives the situation report, and she looks more stern when Shin informs her he will be camping with the princess for the night. Shni informs Tira they have to get moving immediately, when they have only rested for a while, and she even urges Shimmer to run faster than before. It is now nighttime, so Shin and Rion camp somewhere in the desert. Rion comments about the items Shin brought out, and Shin tells her he is always prepared to hit the road with his item box. Rion tries to convince him to join her kingdom because of his capabilities, but he declines again. They have a hearty conversation, and Rion cozies up to him until she dozes off. The next morning, the noisy sounds of an army of monsters wake them up. They discover that the monsters are heading towards the walled city of Valmer, which is also their destination. Rion describes the horde of monsters to be a flood that is released when the magic matter over flowing from the Holy Land coalesces enough which transforms into the monsters. Shin detects that most of the monsters are low level, so he questions why they have set their targets on Valmer. Rion explains that the area around the Holy Ground is protected using a mist Garuda, and the only path to avoid it is the road to Valmer. Valmer City serves as a bulwark fortified to fend off such floods. However, the fortification is limited to the strong and chosen ones in Valmer, because the city suffers major casualties sometimes, so being up against such a major flood is more dangerous. According to Rion's analysis, Shin detects that the situation is beyond him, so he has to hurry Shni, his favorite sidekick up. Shin deduces that it will take a few days before the floods arrive at Valmer, so they have to go and join the guards to fight. Rion is surprised by his decision, but being the battle-loving princess she is, she smiles broadly at it and agrees. Upon their arrival at Valmer, Rion suggests reporting the situation to the Lord of Valmer, while Shin reports at the city's Adventurer's Guild. Rion explains that the guild and the army will be essential to counter such a large-scale invasion. Shin agrees to her inference, and they leave together. Shin arrives at the Adventurer Guild where he meets with the guild master, Baron Lact. Shin tells him about the monsters they saw on their way, and the speed at which they are coming. He brings out the Moon Sanctum letter of introduction, to prove the validity of his words and he tells Baron to ask their lord if he is still in disbelief, because his colleague is currently in touch with them. After seeing the letter, he confirms that Shin is speaking the truth, and he claims he will declare a state of emergency. He also says they would start evacuating the citizens as soon as they receive word from the authorities. 
Baron instructs his subordinate, Eliza, to get in touch with the representatives of every guild. Shin also offers to help with the defense which Baron appreciates sincerely, because they are currently short on chosen words in the city. After Shin leaves the guild, he walks through the streets with plans of meeting back up with Rion. On his way, he spots a wooden image that looks awfully familiar to him. He tries to enter the store, but he finds that it is closed. Just then, Shni informs him she will be arriving at Valmer soon. Shin tells her to inform the local lord and the guild master of her intentions to join the defense. He tells her about the store, and that the name is Meow Land. He questions if the name sounds familiar to her, but she declines. While on his way, he runs into a clumsy <coughs> young man whose name is Barrett, and they both exchange pleasantries after seeing each other for the first time in a long time. Shin is surprised to see his friend's support character from the game, but he thinks it's possible since Shni still exists. They both sit down in a cafe for a cup of hot coffee. Barrett is surprised that Shin didn't wipe the monsters off at once when he spotted them. Shin explains that he couldn't use his full strength because Rion was present there at the time. Barrett admits that high humans are revered like supreme beings in the current time, and he can even see the princess proposing to him if she finds out his full strength. Shin concurs with him. He says he is trying his best to evacuate the flood without revealing his true strength because the princess is already interested in him. Barrett offers to render any help necessary since Shin is his master's friend. Shin asks Barrett about the Meow Land he saw before, and Barrett tells him it belongs to his friend Hibaneko. Shin is shocked that his friend is still in the game. Barrett sees his surprised look, so he knows he is oblivious to the fact that some other players exist. He tells him that his two friends Shadow and Holly are also in Valmer, but they are on a business trip outside the city. Shin wonders what they are still doing in this current world because he thought they died in the death game. Barrett shows him a list of the other players that are present as well, which comes off as a shock to Shin, but Shin knows the other players were linked to him in the game. Barrett cuts Shin's thoughts short by showing him a running list of known individuals who are identified as player killers. PKs. Shin's shocked face looks as though his sword just turned into a rubber chicken. It seems like he may need a reboot because, for a glorified hero like him, he has very little information about his subordinates and the game he is the hero in. Shin introspectively says the PKs took out his friends and other people during the game because they are just useless deviants who enjoy killing for fun. Barrett continues that Shni gave them instructions to find out about the PKs immediately after they found out old players existed in the current world. Apparently, Shni knew about everything but she didn't tell him about it. Shni is one devoted sidekick who has days off from sincerity. Barrett says with a stern face that Shni's action translates to betrayal, so she must be punished as his subordinate. Shin argues blindly that Shni would never betray him, but he remembers her denying having information about the Meow Land when he asked earlier. Barrett realizes that Shin is not budging, so he tells him he is only joking, and he knows Shni would never betray him judging from her personality. He tells Shin he will be leaving to prepare for the Flood too. Shin wonders if he will also be fighting with them, but Barrett declines, saying he is only going to stock up because there are plenty of materials to go around, and he is certain the city is safe with Shin being around. Shin sarcastically remembers Barrett's backstory that he loves money too much. Shin continues walking through the street after properly researching the flood. It turns out that an individual has appeared amid low-level hordes a few times, so the larger the flood, the closer they are to the show. Just immediately, Shin runs into Tierra, while Yuzuha embraces him happily. He wonders if Shni is not done reporting at the local Lord's palace because she is not with them, but Tierra explains that Shni is quite popular so they have refused to let her go. Shin admits that Shni must be having it rough. The next day, they all walk together and this time, Shni is with them. Shni informs Tierra that she is leaving to meet with the Chosen Ones at the Lord's castle because they will be working together in the battle. Shin mentions that Shni returned late in the night, so he didn't have a chance to ask her about what he discussed with Barrett. Shni arrives at the Lord of Valmer's castle along with her team. The Lord of Valmer introduces himself as Taro Yaxfair, and he gives them the formation they intend to follow to defeat the Flood. Shni agrees to train with the Knights. Tierra expresses her pity for the Knights who would train with Shni because they would go through Hell. Unfortunately, Tira just landed herself in the self-acclaimed hell with her blabbermouth because Shni speaks up without hesitation afterward, instructing her to join them in the training. Shortly after, Shin reports to the Lord that there are no signs of monsters in the areas which he thinks must be an effect of the Flood. Lord Toro tells them it has never happened before, but Shni says she has experienced a similar situation where monsters in the areas all disappeared, and shortly after, they came surging forth like a black wave. Shin claims there was no record of it because it was an in-game event, so he is glad she played it off. Shni urges them to take care because he thinks an individual may be leading the flood. Shin concludes the individual is the event boss. After their training, Tierra walks tiredly while Shin commends her endurance and Shni for training them. Shin talks about Shni using a large-scale spell during the opening strike and she agrees to use it since it is the only opportunity she gets to do that. Shni asks Shin what he intends to do next. 
and she talks excitedly like a toddler about working on his disguises. Schnee probably sees mischief in his looks, and she concludes that she doesn't like it. After a lot of training and preparations, everyone is ready for the battle with the Flood because the scouts have confirmed their presence. Shin has probably forgotten that Rion is a warrior princess because he questions if she should be on the battlefield. She excitedly tells him it is a good opportunity to test the Skull Face Sword, so he assigns her to the rear. Shni walks up to Shin when Rion leaves, and she informs him about something he would love to talk about when the battle is over. Shin detects the presence of the Flood, so Shni uses her large-scale spell to blast them off to everyone's surprise. However, the Floods keep coming, and Shin concludes that they are not ordinary. He asks Shni to use the spell again, but she explains that she can't repeatedly use large-scale spells. Shin proceeds to attack the second wave of monsters, and he strikes them with his spells. He hands the rest over to Rion, who commands the knights to keep their guards up. Surprisingly, a strong strike blasts off some of the monsters to Rion's surprise. It turns out to be from Tiara's bow, and she excitedly claims that Shin made it more powerful. Rion continues fighting off the monsters until she faces a larger monster that she struggles to defend herself against. Tiara tries to help her, but she realizes that she has lost a significant amount of mana. Just immediately, Wilhelm arrives to defend Rion, on a request for assistance to save the princess that the Beirelicht Guild received. He also recalls Millie crying to him about the numerous monsters she saw in a vision so she implored him to save Shin. Lassia appears behind Tira, and she helps her restore her mana. Shin, in his case, transforms into a fully armored fighter, and he defends some scouts that are being chased. He tells them to leave his vicinity because he intends to use his full power, and he may end up killing them. He brings out a cursed weapon that scares the scouts away causing them to question who he is. Shin uses the cursed scythe to slash off the monsters seamlessly, while a voice in the scythe clamors for more killings. Shin eventually meets up with the event boss leading the flood, and it turns out to be a demon. This demon is one hell of a weakling because it only has a mind-affecting attack that is effectless against Shin. Shin cuts it off with one strike, and Shni reports to her that they have defeated all the monsters with no record of casualties. After their battle, the Lord of Valmer organizes a celebration party for everyone who defeated the monsters. Tiara and Shin turn out to be annoying party poopers because why would they not wish to be at such a high-class ceremony? They express their desire to go home while Shni seems to be rather excited about it as she looks glamorous in her outfit. Shin walks the two ladies into the party, causing everyone to stare at him. A glorified hero with the two most spectacular ladies in the room is definitely a big flex. Rion calls out to Shin excitedly while Shni asks if anything happened between them when they were together, but Shin declines. Rion arrives, and she teases Shin so hard that Shni has to excuse them. Tiara realizes what is actually going on, so she tactically pushes Shin to go after Shni while she talks to Rion alone. Shin walks up to Shni outside, and she apologizes for stepping away. Shin asks if she is jealous, and Shni admits sincerely that she is, even though she isn't his fiance. Shni apologizes for not telling him about the players, because she knew he would return to the old Shin that placed everyone at arm's length if she did. She says she cannot endure seeing him in that state, because she has lost her sense of self. Shni cries tearfully saying that she thought she could replace her. Unexpectedly, Shin grabs her and apologizes to her. He admits that he would have done the same if it was him. He expresses his gladness for finding her after he thought he was lost because she accepted him openly. After their emotional speeches, Shni asks Shin a question that grabs him by surprise. She asks if he is still in love with Marino, and he affirms, saying his feelings have not changed. Surprisingly, Shni kisses him, and she claims her feelings for him are real so she won't give up. Shin admits that he wasn't expecting her reaction. After a while, they all depart to the next town. 